But we're going to enter the Word of God. And we never want to do that uh, without prayer. This is not an intellectual experience, it's a spiritual experience. So let's, let's solicit the involvement of the Holy Spirit. Let's bow our hearts. Well, Father, we just thank you for the privilege that you've extended to us to be gathered together here to study your word. And Father, we recognize that in your kingdom there are no accidents, no coincidences, that we're all here right now by your divine appointment. And we would seek, Father, that your purpose be accomplished in each of our lives as we go forth. So we thank you, Father, for the privilege. We ask you to be among us, be with us, that your Holy Spirit might open our hearts and lives to your word as we commit this coming time and ourselves into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Well, we're gathered to explore one of the most remarkable books of the Bible, the Epistle to the Colossians. Now, this particular epistle has a number of unique and compelling features. First of all, it's regarded by many scholars as the most elevated view in the entire Bible. That's quite a statement, quite a statement. The other thing, it also, you'll discover, uniquely focuses on advice and counsel that are unique to our day today. That may sound strange, that Paul writing so long ago was as relevant as you'll turn out to be for you and I today. And uh, I'd like to mention, this may seem like a strange way to open up, but my wife and I have just finished a book called The Kingdom, the Power, and the Glory. And it's really, it's not about Colossians, but it's intended to be an overcomer's handbook. And it's, it is, with it is associated a number of other studies. Origin of evil, eternal security, thy kingdom come. Most people have no idea when they pray that what they're praying for. And uh, the whole difference between, you know, about inheritance rewards, that sort of thing. Now the reason I'm mentioning this though is because we've had the privilege in having this book go to press a few weeks ago to have a foreword written by the uh, founder of the ISV, International Standard Version Bible, who's a good friend, but he wrote a foreword. And I was startled with the foreword that he submitted that's in the book because it has relevance to what we're doing today. I want you to just bear with me as I share with you this foreword that William Welty wrote for us. He starts out by pointing out that John, the Apostle John, John must have been puzzled. He was exiled to the lonely island of Patmos And he's just begun to receive what will become known as the most elevated vision of things to come given any person in the history of the planet Earth. The vision begins with a resurrected immortal Jesus of Nazareth dictating seven letters for delivery to the pastors of seven churches that existed during the latter half of the first century. And with eyes of flames like fire and feet like bronze that glows like a furnace, The God-man who once was dead and is now alive forevermore is ill. Bluntly speaking, the immortal man is about ready to vomit. How can it be that an immortal being can apparently become so unwell as to puke? Call the dictated letter eschatological symbolism, if you will. Label it literary allegory or classify it as an apocalyptic literature influenced by Jewish visions of the end of the world from the time between the Old New Testaments. You can even think of the story as mere literary license. It really doesn't matter what name we use to describe the event, because the reality of the letter to the church of Laodicea is that Jesus is sick of lukewarm Christianity. That's the essence of it. He's about to vomit, as writes the Apostle John in Revelation chapter 3, starting at verse 14, going to 17. And this is from the International Standard Version. It says, To the messenger of the church of Laodicea write, The Amen, the witness who is faithful and true, the originator of God's creation, says this, I know your actions, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. Since you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to spit you out of my mouth. 
That's strange language for the Son of God to use, isn't it? You say, I am rich. I've become wealthy. I don't need anything. Yet you don't realize that you are miserable, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Bluntly speaking, Jesus of Nazareth is sick of the lukewarm, useless Christian lifestyles, but he doesn't leave the Laodicean pastor without a solution to the problem. He continues, Therefore I advise you to buy from me gold purified in fire so that you may be rich, white clothes to wear so that your shameful nakedness won't show, and ointment to put on your eyes so you may see. I correct and discipline those whom I love, so be serious and repent. Look, I am standing at the door and knocking. If anyone listens to my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him, and he will eat with me. To the one who conquers, I will give a place to sit with me on my throne, just as I have conquered and have sat down with my father on his throne. Let everyone listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. That's all an excerpt, of course, of the International Standard Version. But William continues, he says, as I write the words of this forward on a rainy, blustery, wintry day in early 2009 here in Southern California, the United States of America and the world in which it exists is entering the most terrifying time in history. The economies of virtually every nation on the earth are collapsing. Unwise American politicians are creating dollars out of thin air, voting into existence more than a trillion dollars merely by agreeing to loan them to businesses that would otherwise have been reorganized through the discipline of bankruptcy courts and free enterprise business realities. Meanwhile, the whole Western world that only six months ago was saying, I am rich and I have become wealthy, I don't need anything is now about to find out from personal experience what it will mean to hear the third horseman of the apocalypse cry out, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius. All of this trouble comes on the world from a God who loves us and who corrects and disciplines those whom he loves. And that's why this message is going to be your roadmap through the times of trouble that are about to refine God's children and judge all of God's enemies. The counsel contained in this remarkable volume will explain what the life of faith is intended by its author to lead to, which is divinely ordered preparation for the rulership in the coming kingdom. May these readers learn to be firmly entrenched overcomers who have no need for exhortation. May we not be the cowardly ones who bury their talents in the ground, wrongly convinced that the God whom we serve reaps where he doesn't sow. Meanwhile, the ancient words of a centuries-old poem haunt me. They're carved in a Gothic medieval alphabet on a towering, ornate cathedral door right in the heart of a small town in Germany. And translated into modern English, the words take the form of a frightening poem. Here is what the poem says. You call me eternal, and then do not seek me. You call me fair, and then do not love me. You call me gracious, and then do not trust me. You call me just, and then do not fear me. You call me life, and then do not choose me. You call me light, and do not see me. You call me Lord, and then do not respect me. You call me master, and then do not obey me. You call me merciful, and do not thank me. You call me mighty, and then do not honor me. You call me noble, and then do not serve me. You call me rich, then do not ask me. You call me Savior, then do not praise me. You call me Shepherd, then do not follow me. You call me the way, and then do not walk with me. You call me wise, and then do not heed me. You call me Son of God, and then do not worship me. When I condemn you, then do not blame me. Ooh, huh? May we allow the God allow God to carry us on to maturity and fitness for ruling as kings and queens in the coming kingdom as we rightly respond to the circumstances and adversities of this present life, which are not worthy to be compared to the glories which will one day be revealed in us. And that, of course, is William Welty's foreword, uh, written a, uh, about a few months ago. He's, of course, drawing upon a, an analogy that we want to draw upon in our study of Colossians. The seven churches... Revelation chapter 2 and 3, the things which are. They were in existence at that time. You ever wonder why God chose those particular seven churches to be representative? Um, each letter has a con concluding phrase. I'm switching to the King James, which I'm more familiar with, obviously. 
He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. That, that closes each of the seven letters. There are a number of applications. Obviously, these were existing local churches at that time. That was corroborated through archaeological research. But it's also intended to be admonitory to all churches. He, he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches, plural. So each letter is to all churches, even though there's seven representative churches being used here. It says, he that hath an ear. How many of you have an ear? Can I see a show of hands? Okay, that's most of us. Okay, good. He that hath an ear, let him hear. This is written to every one of us. So there's a personal level. See, there's different levels under understanding. Local? Sure. Admonitory to all churches in a broad sense? Sure. Homiletic, that is personal. The surprising one is the fourth one. Now, that's the prophetic application. These seven churches turn out, once you understand the letters, to lay out seven eras, consecutive historical eras of the church throughout the last several thousand years. And that's, if they were in any other order, that wouldn't be true, by the way. And the, it turns out everything about each letter is relevant to the, its purpose. The actual name of the church turns out to be relevant to its major theme. The title that Jesus uses of himself in each of those letters is relevant. Each letter has some, a commendation, some concerns, and an exhortation. In other words, some, it's like a report card, some good news and some bad news. And uh, then they have a closing phrase that he that hath an ear let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now what's interesting is there are two churches that have no commendation. Two of the seven have nothing good said about them. And Laodicea is one of those. That should give us pause. Um, there are two churches that have nothing bad said about them. And that's worthy of our study, of course, too. But we won't get into all that here. But what's interesting, if you're very diligent, you know, God always rewards the diligent. And if you look at these letters carefully, you'll notice that the promise to the overcomer in the first three letters are an appendix, like a PS at the end of the letter. But in the last four, the, the, the promise to the overcomer is in the body of the letter. Why is that? Well, if nothing else, it's cluing us that the first three and the last four are somehow distinctive in some way. And we will explore that a little bit. Now, if we take those seven letters, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, we discover by examination that they're representative of the apostolic church, the first century, the persecuted church, the married church, where the church marries the world, the medieval church, the denominational churches that followed out of the Reformation, the missionary church, and finally, the apostate church. And that's going to be our focus in the letter to Colossians, which is one reason I want to give you this background. Now, the first three we know are distinctive. Those have the promises of the overcomer postscripted as sort of an afterthought, in a sense. The last four have them in the body of the letter. And we also notice the last four include uniquely an explicit reference to the second coming of Christ. So that's kind of provocative. We also know that the first of those last four has an explicit promise that if they don't repent, they're going to go through the Great Tribulation, which means if they do, and the others won't. Interesting. One of them has an explicit promise that it'll be removed from the, even the time of that trouble. And the other two are probably problematic. Now, the one we're interested in as we approach the epistle to Colossians is Laodicea, and you'll see why, because Laodicea is expressly addressed within the text. They're to exchange letters, the two of them. In fact, it's interesting, the seven letters of seven churches that Jesus wrote, when somebody says, how many letters are in the New Testament? You say 21. No, there's 28. Everybody overlooks the seven letters Jesus wrote in Revelation 2 and 3. Well, it's interesting, in Paul's epistles, he wrote Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, so forth, 10 different addressees. But three of those addressees are pastors. That means that seven churches Paul wrote. Now, when you start, now, Paul was not a mystic. John was, but Paul wasn't. He's a practical guy putting out practical for his practical churches. And yet we discover the fingerprints of the Holy Spirit all over this thing because the seven letters that Jesus writes to Ephesians, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Paul wrote Ephesus, Ephesians, same one. Is there a letter that speaks of joy through suffering? That the, the Smyrna letter, sir, the letter to Philippians. Is there a letter that was written regarding marriage to the world? Yeah, the Corinthians. 
To be a Corinthians is to be a fornicator. That, that term was used. He was a Corinthian. Thyatira and Galatians linked together. Sardis and Romans. Philadelphia is the, the uh, eschatological of the churches. And Thessalonians, of course, is the eschatological letter of the group. And interestingly enough, the one that corresponds to Laodicea is Colossians. In fact, they're only a mile apart, or so, roughly a mile apart. And they're, they're instructed to exchange letters. So we're going to discover the reason I've gone through this background before we get into the letter itself to give you uh, a, a sense of why this is so relevant to us today. And uh, that'll emerge very clearly as we get into the letter specifically. So we're going to be looking at Colossians and Laodicea together as we go through the study. A couple other questions to be more pondering. We're going to devote this first session to just to getting prepared to jump into this letter. But uh, do heavenly bodies have any influence over our lives? That sounds like a strange question. Millions of people feel that way. Out of 1,750 newspapers, over 1,220 carry astrological columns. A lot of people may not admit it, but they watch those and they take, some people take them very seriously. Another question, is there any relationship between diet and spiritual living? Diet and spiritual living. I'm not talking about diet from a nutritional or hygienic point of view, but from a spiritual point of view. A lot of people have very strong feelings about that. Another question, does God speak to us immediately in our minds or only through His Word? These are questions that if we had an open discussion, many people have very different views on this. Another question, do Eastern religions have anything to offer the evangelical Christian? We're going to be confronting e these and similar issues all through this epistle. You're going to be startled to discover how relevant Paul's concerns are to us in our everyday lives today. And so these very contemporary questions are the very issues that Paul is going to deal with in his, this magnificent epistle. There are many Bible scholars that have concluded that Colossians is the most profound letter that Paul ever wrote. Paul was probably the greatest mind that we ever have encountered. And uh, so unless we depend on the Holy Spirit to teach us, we're going to miss these truths that are hidden here. Now the occasion of the epistle deserves some comment. The Colossians was written by the Apostle Paul about A.D. 60 to 62 while he was imprisoned in Rome. It's astonishing to realize that this letter of encouragement and insight was written, you could almost hear the clank of the chains around his wrists as he's writing this thing, so to speak. Um, he's a prisoner in Rome all this time. And one purpose of the letter, of course, is to clear up the heresies and, uh, that had sprung up uh, in the area of Colossae. And that was one of three cities in the Lycus Valley. Uh, it's about 125 miles from Ephesus, southeast from Ephesus, in the province of uh, Asia Minor. When we say Asia, we mean the Roman province of Asia Minor. You and I would know it today as Turkey, if you will, roughly. And uh, the name of, uh, of Colossians probably, we're not sure, but possibly derived from Colossus, a large and giant statue straddling the harbor. Uh, that's at least in legend. And uh, uh, it's about 12 miles from Heropolis and Laodicea, the other two cities of the valley. So this was a meeting point for East and West, one of the major uh, trade routes, and, uh, and as such was naturally a very fertile ground for re religious speculations and heresies and uh, exchange of ideas. And uh, there are several references in the letter that seem to indicate that Paul himself had not actually visited the city. And uh, the church there was an outgrowth of three years that Paul spent in Ephesus. He spent three years 125 miles away, and some of his converts are the prominent people in Colossians. So he's aware of it secondhand. So effective was the witness of the church at Ephesus that, quote, as it says in the book of Acts, all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus from Ephesus. Now, what a wonderful appellation that would be for a city. And so, but specifically two men, uh, Epaphras and Philemon, who were in Ephesus, seem to have been the ones primarily responsible to establish the uh, founding a church in Colossae. And uh, Epaphras uh, evidently carried a, the thrilling news to the, back to his family in, in Colossae and started a church there. And Philemon had a, a, a church meeting in his home. It's interesting to realize, by the way, that almost everything you read in the New Testament occurred in homes. The first century church was a church in the homes. That, and that's why our materials on that speak of the once and future church. They started in the homes, and we believe it's going to end in the homes. 
as we get into increased persecution and so forth. And it's likely that uh, Apaphia and uh, Archippus were uh, respectively the wife and son of Philemon, and uh, Archippus was probably the pastor of the church. But those are inferences we, we draw. And uh, the church in Colossae was primarily, primarily a Gentile church, about five years old when Paul wrote his letter, and uh, he was at the time a prisoner, as I say. He, met, he had met a runaway slave named Onesimus who belonged to Philemon, one of the leaders of the church at Colossae. This slave ran away, became converted, Paul sends him back and uh, that, uh, uh, admonishes uh, Philemon to take him back as a friend, not as a slave, as a brother in Christ. And, and one of the most charming letters is the little letter of Philemon that accompanies all these letters about this time. And so it's about the same time that Paphras shows up uh, in Rome because he needed Paul's help. So it's his solicitation of Paul's help that results in the letter that he solicits from Paul to Colossa that we're going to be studying here. And uh, according to Paphras' report, that some new doctrines are being taught in Colossa and we're invading the church and creating problems. And uh, that's to have a church is to have problems, right? And uh, the epistle itself uh, seems due to the arrival of Paphras from Colossae, what precipitates all this. And he was, of course, one of Paul's uh, converts and so on. And uh, he had remained with Paul in Rome, and uh, Onesimus and Tychicus carries these epistles to the destinations. The letter to Ephesus was sent to Ephesus, Colossians to Colossians, and of course the note uh, about Onesimus to Philemon. So, th there's a reference made to a letter to Laodicea, and some scholars suspect that we, what we call the letter to Ephesus is the letter to uh, Laodicea. But Laodicea and Colossae were also instructed to exchange letters, so they're relevant, transcends their local application. And Epaphras is called a fellow prisoner, a title given to Archicus, and so he, uh, uh, that means he may have voluntarily chose to be with Paul in prison. We don't know what that, all that, that fully implies. And so it, it, it seems that he willingly accompanied Paul. And uh, so they, both uh, uh, Epaphras and Aristarchus are there to comfort Paul and are referenced at the close of the letter. And so, so these special heresies are what we're going to deal with. And we're going to spend a little bit of time here before we get in the letter to talk a little bit about these peculiar heresies. And these heresies we're going to talk about are called Gnosticism, Gnostics. Now that's a strange label because Gnosticism really emerges about two centuries later, but we see the roots of it here. So we're indulging a little bit, like most scholars do, in somewhat of an anachronism because the, the, the term Gnostics really emerges subsequent to this time period, but its roots are here. So uh, understand there's a, that, that distinction. Gnosticism, it comes from the Greek word gnosis, to know. And uh, they uh, declared themselves in the know, if you will, uh, of the deep things of God. And they felt that they were a sort of a spiritual aristocracy. They were the insiders. They had truth that you really weren't ready for yet, presumably. And these pretensions are very similar to groups today of various kinds. The New Age that kind of thing is fluent. The Gnostics. The Epistle of Colossians is going to deal with all of this by emphasizing Christ's preeminence. That term preeminence is going to have very special meaning before we through. It's a response to the Gnostics. Again, the word Greek gnosis, which means knowledge, and uh, Agnostic, then, is a coined term by Huxley, means without knowledge. It's a Greek term. And if you're at a party, well, I'm an agnostic. You hear people sort of take pride in the fact that they you can't really know, so I'm an agnostic. Do you know what the Latin equivalent of that is? Ignoramus. That doesn't work as well at parties. Well, I'm an ignoramus. It doesn't quite work, you know. But it's the same word, actually. Yeah, of course, uh, the Gnostics were a uh, mixture of mysticism, Eastern speculations, and Jewish legalism. That's a strange mix. It's a very strange mix. But uh, we'll, un we'll get into all of that before the study's over. And it's surprisingly contemporary today in some surpri in very surprising ways. Alexandria, by the way, was one of the major headquarters. And it's for that reason that the Alexandrian Codex is some of the documents we have mo done our modern translations from are documents that have been doctored by the Gnostics, by the way. That's one reason uh, the popularity of the modern translations has waned a little bit and people are going back to Textus Receptus in the translation world. But anyway, 
the uh, Eastern speculations plus mysticism. What we're going to be guarding against as we go through there is man-made traditions and philosophy. And we're going to, we, we won't play favorites, we'll have something to offend everyone. We'll, we'll spread that around quite evenly. The idea that matter was evil was an idea that the Gnostics uh, embraced. They also were, they had some very strange views that are close cousins to astrology. The whole notion that angelic beings are associated with the heavenly bodies and those heavenly bodies influence our lives. That's a, that's a very predominant theme in the area. But to all this, they also stir in a, a good dose of Jewish legalism. Um, good and evil uh, uh, were derived from rules. That's what we really mean by legalism. And uh, we'll talk about circumcision, the Old Testament dietary laws, the kosher laws, uh, some of these ideas where they really came from. And so it may help you to get another perspective of how they, a, a Gnostic might map it. You have God, of course, at the top. And then you have these strange eons or emanations uh, in the form of angels, archangels, principalities, powers, dominions, thrones. These are all some in-between powers between God and Christ. That's, the, 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 that's, the, that's a concept that uh, they took for granted that's an error, of course, but from this all kinds of other errors derive. And from this kind of mapping, you generated two different kinds of Gnostics, Docetic Gnostics and Cerinthian Gnostics. How do they differ? Well, we'll get into it a little bit, but if you remember that the Docetic Gnostics regarded Jesus only as a phantom. He didn't leave footprints. He was a phantom. He wasn't really tangible. That's their concept of Christ. The Cerinthians are a sort of close cousin that he was an intermittent phantom. And I'll explain that here in a minute, but those are two different kinds. The Docetic Gnostics, uh, which uh, comes from the word they, he seemed to be real, see? They held that Jesus did not have a real human body, but only a phantom body. That was their viewpoint. He was, in fact, an eon, an emanation from God, and had no real humanity. He was an illusion of some kind. Well, that doesn't really quite fit the historical record, obviously, in a lot of ways. And we're going to discover, as we study the evolution of Judaism in another one of our subsequent sessions, how we get into trouble by just letting our tether get a little too long from the text. If you stick with the text, there's safety. But if you start getting away from the text, you get uh, not only an error, but your ideas actually become inverted in a strange way. And we'll look at that as we go. The Cerinthian Gnostics, their followers of a guy by the name of Cerinthus, admitted the humanity of Christ, but claimed that Christ was just an eon that came on Jesus at his baptism in the form of a dove and left him on the cross so that only the man, Jesus, died. The idea is sort of a double thing that came and went is sort of the their variation of the Gnostic heresy. See, some thought that Jesus was just a man, similar to Christian science or other phases of so-called new thought. That's probably a very prevalent perception in today's world, too. They, many people acknowledge that he was maybe a great teacher, a great example, all that sort of thing. You know, that was one of the uh, uh, great tragedies, in my mind, to the uh, Mel Gibson's movie, The Passion. I think he did a remarkable job, despite some of the Roman Catholic overtones to it. But it has two serious deficiencies. The first, it creates the impression that the, the uh, crucifixion was a tragedy. No, it's an achievement that was planned before the foundation of the world. Hundreds of spe detailed specifications confirmed to make it what it was. The second, thing it, the second deficiency is it doesn't tell you who he was. He wasn't some great teacher, guy that did miracles, all that. No, no, no. The creator incarnate. And, and uh, unless you understand that, nothing, none of that makes any sense at all. But anyway, Paul's going to deal with all these heresies very directly. Others, by the way, held that he was a spiritual, not material. And John, the apostle, his writings deal with that directly. And uh, so this heresy sharpens because uh, concerning the person of Christ, was all, that's already been set forth in the Philippian letter, the kenosis. For those of you who studied Philippians 2, I won't take the time here. But in any case, Paul meets these things squarely, powerfully in his full-length portrait of Christ as the Son of God and Son of Man, both deity and humanity, in opposition to both types of the Gnostics. So it, you will, we'll get the feeling that Colossians was written directly for our own day as we embrace these things head on. And uh, we'll see that with so many people today, so many different groups, rob Christ of his deity. Every cult group finds some approach to dismiss 
uh, or minimize the deity of Christ. They'll yield all kinds of other things, but that. And Huxley's the guy that coined the term agnostic, meaning without knowledge. And uh, Paul coins a term epignosis, which is really super knowledge. Paul is going to use the vocabulary of the Gnostics to upstage them with Christ, in effect. And uh, so, so, uh, but, but, uh, so all these heresies promise people, you know, spiritual perfection if they enter into the teachings and ceremonies described. There's always somebody that has a better way, the inside uh, secret, if you will. And this depth and full knowledge could only be enjoyed because you're one of the initiated. And uh, they're all based on man-made traditions and philosophy, not divine truth. So all these views undermine the very foundations of the Christian faith and attack the person and work of Jesus Christ. That's what this is all about. Not about groups or movements or trends. It's about a person. What do you believe about the person of Christ? When Jesus asks you, whom do you say that I am? That's the key issue all the way through here. And uh, see, to them, to the Gnostics, he was but one of God's many emanations. And not the very Son of God come in the flesh. That's the distinctive. The incarnation itself, according to Matthew chapter 1, means God with us, Emmanuel. God is with us. Not some emanation. God Himself is with us. But these false teachers claim that God was keeping His distance from us. And uh, so when we trust the Son of God, there is no need for any intermediate beings. You don't need any intermediate priest. He is our high priest directly. And so on. And of course, his work on the cross settles the sin question, and we're going to deal with that head on too. And it completely defeated all the satanic forces, and we're going to celebrate that in the second chapter. And he put an end to the legal demands of the law. And Colossians is going to hit that just like the book of Romans does. And uh, he alone is the preeminent one and completely sufficient. If you have Christ, you need nothing else. He's, he, he's all that we need. Now, Gnosticism contains several characteristics. It was Jewish, stressing the need for observing the Old Testament laws and ceremonies, and there are people, Christians, that will try to get you to do that same thing. So be on your guard there. There are some dangers there. Gnosticism was philosophical, laying emphasis on some special or deeper knowledge, secret knowledge. It involved the worship of angels. Boy, it's interesting to see how consistent in the Old Testament and the New. Angels don't allow them Elves get worship. One did, got in a big a lot of trouble, right? Okay. And so uh, Gnosticism was exclusive, stressing special privilege, perfection of the select flu who belonged to the philosophical elite. And so we're going to find that this epistle is going to call forth one of the greatest declarations of Christ's deity found anywhere in the scripture. That's quite a statement. And we'll encounter that before the chapter one is finished. So another thing, another strange view that I want to touch on is the Gnostics came to the conclusion, the false conclusion, that matter was evil. They started to associate tangible matter with the evilness. And uh, that a powerful spirit w- a world used material things to attack mankind. They held to a form of astrology, believing that angels are associated with heavenly bodies that then influenced affairs on the earth. And this shows up in the strangest ways in Jewish literature. It will not just... Uh, these other things. And so we also have a mix of Eastern speculations in here. That uh, the idea that the rite of circumcision was helpful in spiritual development. They still hit that. That's a very, that had a very specific purpose. We'll talk about that. The Old Testament diet, kosher laws. We're going to talk about that before we're through here. And uh, the fact that good and evil can be derived from rules and regulations. So this leads to a form of asceticism. Matter is not evil. Neither is the human body. Our fallen human nature wants to control the body and use it for sin, but the body itself is not evil. Or Jesus would never have come to earth in a natural body. That should be enough to refute that basic approach. And he wouldn't, and, and nor would he have enjoyed everyday blessings, like attending wedding feasts or dinners. Diets and disciplines may be good for one's health, but they have no power to develop true spirituality. If you're going to be a vegetarian for, veg- for nutritional reasons, Great, but don't attribute any spiritual dimension to that. That's a fallacy. And there are other examples I could pick. We're in an age of syncretism. See, these false teachings were a synthesis or a, a, a syncretism of Oriental philosophies, pagan astrology, mysticism, asceticism, 
with a, with a dash of Christianity. Something for everybody. Have you heard that kind of appeal? That's very popular today, isn't it? Somehow attempt to harmonize and unite different schools of thought into some kind of composite religion. Why do we have this strange drive to mix it all together? These teachers claim that they were not denying the Christian faith, but only lifting it to a higher level. Paul is going to take that one right out from under him. And do we have any of these heresies today? Of course we do. And they're ever more dangerous than they were in that first century. There's nothing new in the new age. Every modern erroneous cult is some, has some ancient satanic heresy revived. And one of the most interesting things I've observed in my more than 50 years of study is that every heresy you encounter is anticipated specifically in the Scripture. You name it, whatever it is. Reincarnation. Hebrews 9.27, as appointed men once to die and after this to judgment. Why is that there? To, to refute, you know, in, 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 every, every heresy you can find is specifically anticipated by the Holy Spirit. And uh, so, Satan has nothing new to offer. And, uh, you know, we, have a, we live in an era of religious toleration. One religion is as good as another. Many people try to take the best from various religions and fabricate their own. To them, Christ is only one of several great religious teachers, no more authority than they have. See, they may treat him as prominent, but not preeminent. And Paul is going to nail this issue of preeminence. And the epistle of Colossians is perhaps the, the, the main theme there. And uh, so uh, when we make Jesus Christ and the Bible only part of a total religious system or philosophy, we cease to give him preeminence. That's subtle, but important to recognize. We need to strive for spiritual perfection and fullness by, when we do that by formulas or disciplines or rituals, we go backward rather than forward. It astonishes me to watch many church Christian churches advance themselves by going back to the dark ages, to the smells and bells, as some people would say, icons and incense. Why on earth do they want to emulate a period of time when the Word of God was not readily available, people were generally illiterate and couldn't read, why, and, and thus we have these other things going on, why do we want to go back to that when we live in an era where the Word of God is more available than it's ever been in human history? I carry six Bibles in my phone. I can search Hebrew or Greek in my phone. I have a laptop that has more volumes than you that populate most seminaries, and I can search it, I can word search it. If somebody gave me the 30 volumes of the Antonicene Fathers, I don't have time to study or read those. It'd take a lifetime. But I have it in my laptop, and I can find out what Irenaeus said to John about love. It'll show me in a few seconds. You see, in other words, the power we have with the information appliances, the availability of the Word of God. And these tools, by the way, are free for a large, a large measure. So, anyway, you want to be careful about... Uh, uh, rituals and so forth, uh, this idea of going backward. And beware of mixing our Christian faith with alluring things as yoga, transcendental meditation, oriental mystic, and all. Everybody has something to improve it. You don't need to improve it. Christ is complete. And beware of this deeper life teachers that offer some kind of victory or special system. In all things, give Jesus Christ preeminence and you'll discover He's sufficient. There's nothing new. Every heresy has been anticipated by the Holy Spirit. And no one familiar with the book of Colossians will ever be misled by the specious sophistries and various cult systems that are being foisted on a credulous public. And there's a whole list of these that just continue. So with this background, we can start to focus on the epistle itself. Written about the same time as the letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians is on the church, the body of Christ. Colossians is on Christ, the head of the body. They're very similar, and yet they have that distinctive, if you're alert to it. Ephesians speaks of Christ as a prophet, Hebrews as a priest, Colossians as a king. The prophet, priest, and king, the three primary offices of the Mashiach, the Messiah. Now Paul will use the, the vocabulary of these false teachers but with their true meaning. It's going, to, it's going to be interesting to watch his words of fullness, perfect, or completeness. 
wisdom. All these terms that are popular in the Gnostic writings, Paul uses, but with accurate and valid effect. The word all, all this, over 30 times he uses that term. And he speaks a lot about angels and spirit powers. There's no need for you and I to worry about that. He'll put that down. And God sent His very Son to die for us. Every person that believes on Jesus Christ is saved and is part of His body, the church, of which He is the head. That's the complete, long, and short of it. And there will be people trying to attack that, and we'll try to deal with each one of those issues. Nothing need be added. If you have Christ, there's nothing you can add. He's complete. Every believer is complete in Him, totally sufficient. You know, when you say that, it's just words that, well, of course. No, watch. It's a very challenging thing to embrace and understand. And Paul did not begin by attacking these false teachers or their doctrines. Interesting point. He doesn't attack them in that way. He begins by exalting Christ and showing His preeminence. There's a lesson for us. Don't get caught up in attacks on that. Don't unsell that. Sell Christ, in effect, okay? And he does it in five ways. The gospel message, the whole issue of redemption, what really went on there, the creation, what's really going on there, and that will surprise you as we get into that a little bit, the church, and Paul's own ministry. Those are the, 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 the way he dealt with it, head on. And now in chapter 2, he exposes the false origin of those teachings and how they contradicted everything Paul had already taught them about Jesus Christ. The believer who masters chapter 2 is not likely to be led astray by any new improved form of Christianity. And of course, the greatest antidote for false teaching is a godly life. So chapters 1 and 2 are the doctrinal chapters. Chapter 3 and 4 is the application with some important exhortations. Wrong doctrine always leads to wrong living. And what we believe determines how we behave. People, what, you know, Character is what you do when you don't think anyone's looking, right? So chapter 1 is Christ's preeminence declared. Chapter 2 is Christ's preeminence defended. In chapter 3 and 4 together will be Christ's preeminence demonstrated. So those of you who like outlines, there's all D's for you. Declared, defended, and demonstrated. We'll do one better here in a minute anyway. Christ's preeminence, the doctrine of Christ's preeminence is declared in chapter 1. The dangers are involved by Christ's preeminence being defended in chapter 2. And in chapters 3 and 4, the duty we inherit is to have Christ's preeminence demonstrated in our lives. That's our goal. That's our goal. And we're not going to do this in a rush. We could do this, we're going to go through this verse by verse as carefully as we can. And uh, We'll take the, the chapter 1 in four parts, the gospel message, the redemption, creation, and church issues. And then chapter 2, beware of uh, empty philosophies, beware of religious legalism, and beware of man-made disciplines. It's amazing, you, uh, beware of religious legalism. It's funny how we always want to do things by rules. Don't do this and don't do that, and so forth. And... Uh, I noticed that walking in here, a little sign there, don't step over the wall. It never occurred to me. Yeah, we can take a shortcut. We just stepped over the wall. It was easier to, you know, to get, get around to the, enter there. Christ's preeminence demonstrated in our personal purity, in Christian fellowship, in the home, in daily work, and in Christian witnesses, and in Christian service. So that's the outline. We're going to work our way through the four chapters, verse by verse. Now, the spiritual order, if we look at these, the, the Paul's epistles, Romans, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Romans is doctrine, 1 Corinthians is reproof, and Galatians, correction. The Word of God is suitable for instruction, for doctrine, reproof, and correction, and those first three have to do with salvation, soteriology. The next three, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, have the doctrine, reproof, and correction in ecclesiology, the church, in its mystical sense. And of course, Thessalonians is uh, eschatology, eschat eschatological. But we're, we're focused, of course, on Colossians and corrections, if you will, for the ecclesia. Now, let's talk, let's just summarize what we're going to be picking up here on Christ, Christology, if you will, the visible form of the invisible God. 
the prior head of all creation. We'll un unravel those terms as we go. In him, the universe was created. He is before the universe. He, in him, the universe coheres. The head of the body, uh, uh, the church, he's the head of it. And uh, he's the firstborn among the dead. What does that really mean? And we'll get into all that. A couple of quick verses to get a flavor of where we're headed here. These are incredible verses in and of, the, in and of themselves. Colossians chapter 1, verse 16 and 17. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him are all things held together. He didn't only create it, it's his moment by moment continuance that they continue to exist. And he's going to let go. We'll talk about that. There's some surprises perhaps. Another quote in chapter 1, he is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning of the firstborn of the dead that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should full, all fullness dwell. That's quite a statement. That in him, in Christ, should all fullness dwell of the Godhead. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. Comprehensive statements here, and we're going to explore each one of those. And we'll also hit some of these other, what I would consider tangential issues, astrology, angels, and heavenly bodies. And Paul will denounce these with vigor. On the cross, Jesus won complete victory over all satanic powers. Nothing we need to tremble before. Christians do not need to turn to the rudiments, that is the elemental things, referring to the beings, uh, to being controlling the heavenly body. That's a Gnostic term that they were trying to sell. Horoscopes and superstitions deny the person and work of Jesus Christ. They're satanic and they're dangerous. They're not just little idle pastimes. They're, they're entries for heavy things. That's one of the questions that we're going to explore as we go here. Do heavenly bodies have any influence over lives? And of course we have this whole astrology thing. And there's this issue of diet and, and, and spiritual living. Does God speak to us immediately or in our minds? We'll talk about that. And do Eastern religions have anything to offer us in the, as evangelical Christians? These are very contemporary questions. The very issues Paul dealt with in this incredible epistle. And as I've said before, I just get in front of us, he, many scholars believe Colossians is the most profound letter Paul has ever written. And uh, we need, of course, to depend on the Holy Spirit. Mysticism, legalism, man-made philosophies are secretly creeping into our churches today. They are not denying Christ, but they are dethroning Him and robbing Him of His rightful place of preeminence. You need to understand that that's the first step is to dethrone Him. So anyway, of this list, of course, we're going to, in the next session, take the first half of chapter 1, the gospel message and redemption. So for your next session, I would like you to read, study carefully the first half, verses 1 through 14. Review your own notes on the basics. Why is there, ev why is there evil in this world if creation is made by a holy God? That's an interesting question. If you've been through some of our preliminary materials, you'll have some notes on that issue. We'll talk a little bit about that. Can you lose your salvation? Boy, for 400 years within the Christian body, there's been a war going on between the Calvinists and Arminius about this. We'll deal with that head on with some surprises. They're both right and they're both wrong. And both right in what they assert and both wrong in what they deny. And we'll get into that a little bit. Can you lose your salvation? We'll have a very surprising answer to that, I believe. So with that, we'll stand for a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this epistle. We do pray, Father, that you would, through your Holy Spirit, reignite in each of us a renewed appetite and hunger for your word, that we each might grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, that we each might fully appreciate that he is indeed preeminent above all things, and totally sufficient for our needs, as we commit ourselves into your hands in his name, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.